Now we're going to look at bubble sort. Bubble sort is one of the slowest of the well-known sorting algorithms and therefore would not be the first choice for many people. But I think it's easy to understand in terms of how it works and therefore I think it's a good choice for trying to understand how to analyze code. Now, before we see how to actually do this, let me remind you of something we saw in previous videos. So I gave you some code snippets that look something like this. This is C code. So if we look at this, what's actually happening? Well, I equals zero is executed in the beginning, and that happens one time. Then it immediately comes over and asks a question, is I less than N? If that's true, well then we enter the body of the loop, we process this, and now that we're at the bottom of the loop, and technically curly brackets aren't necessary here, but if this helps your understanding, we could add those. We're at the bottom of the loop, we go up, execute I++, plus plus. then we come over and ask, is I less than N again? If it's true, then we come back in here, update sum, we're at the bottom, increment I, come over and test and repeat. So once again, we execute I equals zero exactly once. The question I less than N, how many times does that operate? Well, you think the loop runs N times because we start at zero and keep going as long as I is less than N, but we have to eventually have this fail. So this part right here actually executes one additional time. So this is n plus one. Sum plus equal i. I'm just gonna write sum here. That executes n times. And i plus plus also executes n times. So what we get from this is n plus n plus n is three n. One and one is two. We get that the cost, which is a function of n, so 3n plus 2 is our cost function, and it's a function of n. Now when n is small, like let's say n was 1, we have 3 times 1 is 3 plus 2. The 2 here is a large portion of the overall cost. But if you think about it, as n gets really large, let's say n was 1,000, this would be 3,000 plus 2, which is still basically just 3,000. So as n gets really large, this part right here doesn't really matter. And we found that the order of growth for this, if we were looking at the big O value for order of growth, there's others, but for the big O value, it was just N. So if we take this and look back at this, we see that really the bulk of the costs as N gets really large comes from how many times the loop runs. And in particular, we could say it's based on, you know, how many times we ask this question is I less than N. So if we just looked at this, we could have came up with basically the same answer by saying, well, how many times does this run? N plus one times, big O of that would be N. Now you can't always just count loops and get the tightest fit you can, but in many cases you can. And we're gonna use this idea for analyzing bubble sort, which is why I'm bringing it up. So as we look through some different implementations of bubble sort, we're going to focus primarily on asking the questions of how many times do we make certain comparisons or perform swaps if we're sorting things or something like that. We're not going to go through and count individual instructions like we did earlier to help you understand what's going on. So now let's look and say, how does bubble sort work? So let's say I have these numbers, three, four, one, two. So the way bubble sort works is we're going to take the first two elements, these two right here, and ask, are they in the correct order? We're going to assume we want to go in ascending order, which means smallest to largest. So in that case, these are in the correct order. So then we immediately move over and compare the second to the third element and ask the same question. Are these in the correct order? They're not. So we would swap the, the four and the one. So the three is left where it's at. We now have one here, we have four here, and we have two here. And now we move over again. Whether we swap or not doesn't change the fact that now we're gonna move over and look at the next pair, which would be these right here. And these are also in the wrong order. So the three and the one stay where they're at, and we swap these two. 
So what we've just done is we just worked our way down and how many comparisons did we make? Well, here we have n equals four elements, but we compared once, twice, three times. So we had n minus one comparisons. Okay, and that's gonna be a general principle for the way this works. We worked our way down, but we can see this is not completely sorted. So what do we do? We go back to the beginning now. So we worked down and made our n minus one comparisons, and now we're gonna go back and start over. So we compare three and one. Those are not in the correct order. So we have one, three, two, four. Then we move over by one, compare three and two. Those are not in the correct order. So one, two, three, four. And then we compare these. Those are in the correct order, so we leave them where they're at. And then what do we do? Depending on your implementation, we could, well, we probably still wouldn't stop here, but let's just continue on for our absolute worst case for what we might do. We come back to the beginning, compare one and two, those are fine. Two and three, those are fine. And three and four, those are fine. And the data is actually sorted. So we're gonna stop. Now, how many times did we do this? Well, notice here we did this once. That's what the lines are for. This is one complete run, these three lines. Then these two lines right here are another run. And then this bottom part is the third run. So here we had n minus one uh, iterations of processing an entire row. Okay. Now, what are some things we can notice about this? Notice that for this first pass, once we made it all the way to the end, the largest number in the set was in the last position. We don't say anything about any of the others, but we're guaranteed, this is one of the ways bubble sort works, we're guaranteed that whatever the max element is, if we're trying to put it in ascending order, the max element will be in the last position by the time we get to the end. Now it could have started there, it didn't in this case, so it won't matter if it started there, if it began at the very beginning, had to move the farthest, or if it's somewhere in the middle like we have here, we're guaranteed it will be in the final position at the end. Then at the end of the second run, we're guaranteed that the two largest elements will be in the two last places. So notice the three has moved to here. And then our final, we look at what we had here and we're right here. Again. After the third pass, we're guaranteed that the top three places will have the top three largest numbers. And that's gonna happen every single time. So we're guaranteed that in this case, if we have these numbers, three, four, one, and two, in any order originally, we're guaranteed after the first run, the four will be there. After the second complete run, through all the numbers again, the three and the four will be there. After the third complete run, no matter what the original order is, we would have the top three numbers, two, three, and four in this case, there. And because we've already assigned three out of the four values to their final position, the last number with the one has to go in the final position. So this right here is our n minus one. We have four numbers, which is n. n minus one equals three is how many runs it takes to get the top n minus one positions filled correctly. And then the last one just goes in the default, okay? We're gonna remember that to analyze some of this. So there's different ways you can implement, excuse me, implement bubble sort. I wanna look at several of those and try to understand what changes to the code do to our analysis. So let's look at this implementation. We assume there's already some array D created that would actually have some cost. It has N elements. We created these variables, of course, that has some real world cost. But here's the code that does what I just described. The I loop here is the one that makes it move through an entire run. Or excuse me, it's, if we go back to here, this part right here would be I equals zero, this would be I equals one, I equals two. So that's the part that's working down. And notice here, this is zero to N minus one. So this shows this runs N minus one times. Runs n minus one times for this code there's nothing here that keeps it from doing that okay 
Then as we move to the right, we're using the K loop, which goes from zero to K, as long as K is less than minus one. For this code, there's nothing here that overrides that. So what do we do each time? On each iteration, we ask the question, is D sub K, which is the left element, is it greater than the right element in our comparison? D sub K plus one. We execute that every single time. And if they're out of order, then we perform a swap. That's how it works. Okay. So why is this going from zero to N minus one? We know there's N elements. Why is this not run N times? Well, we're always asking about the left element to the right element. So if we have four things, like we did before, we have k here, this is k plus one, then we have k here and k plus one, k here, k plus one. If this loop actually ran n times, then finally we would be comparing this value to what's to the right of it, which would be wrong. So what's our analysis here? Let's ask the question, how many times did we ask this question here? How many times do we compare a left element to a right element? And we know it runs n minus one times n minus one times, which is n squared minus n minus n is minus two n plus one. So there's our function of n. Now we can have different scenarios. So what are our best case? worst case and average case scenarios here. Best case we would assume is the data already in order. One, two, three, four. But if it is, how does that affect what's happening here? Well, we still ask this many questions, okay? So this is big O of N squared. Does it affect the running at all? Well, yes, because if it's already in order, we don't swap at all. So these three lines of code will never execute in the best case scenario, which will affect actual runtime. But remember, we're looking for the order of growth, which would be n squared here. If we put an upper bound on it, we're using big O. Worst case will be complete reverse order. Four, three, two, one. But we still ask this question, n squared times. Now the actual effect on the running would be that the swap executes uh, every single time that we need to swap something. So not every comparison, because remember after the first pass, the four would be here. So we won't actually perform a swap there. So we'd, we would swap all of these to get the four there. Then we would swap to get the three to here. Then we'd swap to get the two here. But the most number of swaps that we would expect for any particular data would occur in this case. And then finally, average case, the number of swaps will vary depending on what the actual order of the data is. But this question here still is asked big O n squared times. So for this implementation, here's the big O values for all these. Let's look at a different version. This version will exploit the fact that we know that for the example we just showed, we know the four will end up here at the end of the first run. So we don't need to do a comparison on the second run to the four. We know it's not gonna change. And then we know after the end of the second run, we'll have a three and a four here. So there's no reason in the future to ever compare anything to the three. Then after the third run, we have the two there and the four there and the three. So there's no reason to compare them. So we can actually shorten the K loop each time we still have the I loop run n minus one times, but the K loop runs n minus one minus I. So how does that give us what we want? Well, let's look at this. We have I, and this would be n minus one minus I. So when I is zero, this is n minus one minus zero, which is just n minus one. So the first time, the K loop does run n minus one times. And then when the i is one, we have n minus one minus one, which is n minus two times, i is two, n minus one minus two, which is equal to n minus three times, dot, dot, dot. 
Now the last value of i will be n minus one, but when that happens, the test fails right here and the k loop doesn't execute. So the last value of i that the k loop sees will be n minus two. And so n minus one minus n minus two will be equal n minus one plus n plus two, which is one. So we can see the first time the k loop runs n minus one times, then n minus two times, then n minus three times, all the way down to one. And so what is that? So the k loop will run n minus one plus n minus two plus dot 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 plus two plus one. If we reverse these, it make it easier to see the pattern, which is one plus two plus dot 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 plus n minus one. And the sum of the first n minus one integers, starting at one, will be n minus one times n minus one plus one divided by two, which would be equal to n minus one times n over two, which is n squared minus n over two. That's the k loop. The k loop will execute or ask this question is d sub k greater than d sub k plus one this many times. But remember, we also have the i loop running. Or actually the i loop is already incorporated in that. So this will actually be our final. So when i was equal to zero, we got this. When i was equal to one, we got this. So we don't need to multiply this by i. This will be our actual count of how many times it's executed. So what is that in terms of big O and stuff? Let's rewrite it this way. This is one half n squared minus one half n. And the big O on that is still n squared. Okay? So this has to be associated with different cases. Let's say best case, worst case, average case again, just like before. Does the particular data affect how many times we ask this question? The answer is no. All it affects is how many times there's a swap. So if the data is already in order, we don't swap anything, but we still have to ask this question, big O of n squared times, even in the best case. And our maximum number of swaps, now we don't have any additional comparisons for things that can't possibly be swapped because of their position. This right here is what we're exploiting, right? But nonetheless, we still got this right here. And finally, average case is just gonna be the same thing. So in terms of actual runtime, this does save us some comparisons. It doesn't save us any swaps, but it does save comparisons, which does ultimately affect runtime. But the order of growth is still always n squared. So both of these versions, version one and version two, did not stop once data is sorted. Sorted. Right? Even if we had this to start with, one, two, three, four, we saw with both of these, because of the nested loops, they just ran all the way through and kept doing things, even once you could confirm the data is sorted. So now we're gonna look at a third version that's gonna make it possible to do that. Let's look and see how this works. So this has a do while loop in C. And the way that works is if we have a traditional while loop, let's say we had like this, i is equal to uh, zero while i less than n, do something, do something, and then say i plus plus. What happens? We initialize i to zero, and then when we test, we ask the question, is i less than n. There's a possibility that it fails here and never executes this right here, okay? If we expect that to always happen, well, obviously we wouldn't be doing this, but it is a possibility. In the case of a do while, what happens is you run the body of the loop once before you ever test. And even if the test fails the first time, this code right here has executed once. So for situations where you need this to work at least once, before you start asking questions, you may choose a do while. You still could sort of make it work here, but you would have to write some 
convoluted code to make that happen. So here's a use of the do while. And why do we do that? Well, let's say we have this right here. One, two, three, four. We don't know it's sorted unless we look at it first. So how does this work in this case? We enter the do while and I'm gonna have this flag variable that represents my assumption that the data is already sorted unless I find out otherwise. So what will happen here? Sorted equals one, which is true. So my K loop here still runs n minus one time. So I'm gonna compare these two. I'm gonna compare these two and I compare these two. Because no swaps occur, because none of these are out of order, what will happen is here I get to the bottom and say while not sorted, this is not true and the loop stops. That way I only have to ask this question n minus one times. I ask, are the two pairs of value, or, or excuse me, are the two numbers in the pair that we're currently looking at, one and two, then two and three, three and four, I ask that question n minus one times. So that means in the best case, we have a big O of n, right? n minus one has an order of growth of n for our best case scenario, which is this. What about worst case? Well, worst case would be the reverse order, but let's use a slightly different example to make it clear what happens here. So uh, let's say we have one, two, four, three. So this says, assume that it's sorted. I'm gonna compare one and two. Then I'm gonna compare two and four. Then I'm gonna compare four and three, but four and three are out of order. So what happens is we enter this part right here where we swap four and three to get this right here, and I change sorted to zero. In C, zero means false. So when I say while not false, then I'll get, this means true. Not false is equal to true, so this runs again. But when I come back up here, now I'm gonna reset sorted to be one. That is, we're gonna assume again, now the data is sorted. So I'm gonna compare one and two again, compare two and three again. Now compare three and four. Everything is in the correct order, so these two lines of code do not execute Therefore, sorted is still one, and I get that not true is really equal to false, and this fails, and we stop. So in this case, we made two passes through this, and then stopped. Now, when there's only four elements, all we did was save one pass, but if there was a thousand elements or a million elements, we saved a lot of comparisons, which is why if the data is already sorted, or close to being sorted, we still get pretty good order of growth. Okay? So what would be worst case? Worst case, of course, would be the data in completely reverse order. And we do just like we did in the previous examples where we would have to go through and put the four in the final position, then put the three in the final position, then put two in its final position, and as a result, one would already be in its final position. So we're still gonna get n squared because the do while will run its n minus one times, the k loop runs n minus one times, so we have this right here. So that leaves us now asking, what is the average case? Okay. So this one is a little more challenging to analyze now because of the way the loop runs, because now we can stop once we figured out that everything is in the proper order. So what are we gonna do? It's gonna be really too difficult for us to know how many runs there will be. So instead of counting swaps, what we're gonna do, or excuse me, instead of counting comparisons, what we're gonna do is count swaps. Okay, and how do we do that? If we look through a set of numbers, let's say we have one, four, two, three, and if we happen to be looking at these two numbers, four and two, we can see they're out of order relative to the way we want to sort. And when that happens, we have what's called an inversion. And for each inversion, we ultimately have a swap. 
So if we can count the number of inversions, we can determine the number of swaps. But we're trying to find the average, so we'll get that the average number of swaps is equal to total swaps or inversions for all permutations of the data, permutations of n values. Okay, if, if we have n things like four, how many different ways are there to arrange permutations or arrangements? How many different thing, ways are there to arrange four things? We take the total number of swaps or inversions for all the different permutations and divide by the total number of permutations. And that will give us the average. So how do we determine that? Well, let's look at an example. This would be worst case. Four, three, two, one. What we need to do is look at every pairing of these values where we, we don't compare to itself. So the easiest way to keep track of this would be start, say, with a four, and say four can be paired with three, four can be paired with two, four can be paired with one, three. Three can be paired with four, but we already took care of it here. So now we're just gonna look to the right. So three can be compared with two, three can be compared with one, and likewise, we only look to the right, two can be compared with one, and how many of these are inversions? Well, four and three are in the wrong order. Four and two are in the wrong order. Four and one are in the wrong order. Three and two are in the wrong order. Three and one are in the wrong order. And two and one are in the wrong order. And so we have six inversions. What if we were to reverse the order? And put one, two, three, four. Now our pairings, we still have the same pairings except the values are all reversed. So we'll have one and two together, one and three, one and four, two and three, two and four, and three and four. One and two is not an inversion. One and three is not an inversion. Not an inversion, not an inversion, not an inversion, not an inversion. So here we have zero inversions. In a moment, it'd be more clear why we did both. But let's look at this and say this is 6 plus 0 equals 6 inversions for the pair. Okay. Let's look at a slightly different example just to make it more clear. So let's say we have 4, 2, 3, 1. Now the pairings are 4 and 2. 4 and 3, 4 and 1, just like before, 2 and 3, 2 and 1, and 3 and 1. 4 and 2 is an inversion, 4 and 3 is an inversion, 4 and 1 is an inversion, 2 and 3 is not an inversion, but 2 and 1 is, 3 and 1 is, so here we have 5 inversions. If we reverse this to get 1, 3, Two, four. Our pairings are one and three, one and two, one and four, three and two, three and four, and two and four. One and three is not an inversion. One and two is not. One and four is not. Three and two is. Three and four is not. And two and four is not. So here we have one inversion. And what is that together? 5 plus 1 equals 6 for the pair. We had 6 before, so what's going on here? Well, let's think about it, and this will tell us why we reversed it and looked at that. If I have a sequence, you know, and somewhere in there I have elements A and B in this order, okay, so this is a particular pairing, and then we reverse it, And this, I'm just saying the X is mean. We don't care what those are for right now. Here I have B and A. And we'll say A does not equal B, so they're distinct. 
That means if this is an inversion, that is A is less than B, this is not an inversion. Right? If we have three and one, this would be one and three. So this is an inversion, not an inversion. And likewise, if this was not an inversion, this would have to be an inversion, assuming they're distinct. If they're equal, if we have four and four, swapping it doesn't matter. But what I'm getting at is if we look at one particular sequence, for every pairing, because these are really the same numbers, if, we, if you forget order, we have four and two here, we have two and four. Four and three, three and four. Four and one, one and four. We have the same groups, just in reverse order each time. So if one of these is an inversion on one side, it's not an inversion on the other. So as a pair, they have a combined total of inversions that's always the same. The question is, what is that? Well, going back to what we saw before, for the worst case, we saw that the worst case was all the pairings were equal to inversions, which left zero on the other side. So how many different pairings do we have? Well, here we have four elements. And so first we had three, then we had two, we had one. So if there's n elements, then we have one plus two plus dot 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 plus n minus one pairings, which is equal as we saw before. That would be n squared minus n divided by two pairs. Does that work here? Well, n was equal to, in this example, n is equal to four. So we have four squared minus four over two. 16 minus four is 12. Divide by two is six. Yeah, we have six pairings. So now let's pull all this together to see how this works. Because remember our goal is still to count across all permutations the number of uh, swaps that take place. So if we have three numbers, it doesn't matter what three numbers are, but I'm gonna use one, two, and three for this example. Our permutations of these are one, two, and three. And what was the reverse of this? Three, two, and one. And then what was another permutation? One, three, two, and the reverse of that would be two, three, one. And then our other permutations would be two, one, three, and three, one, two. So is this every permutation? Yes. So what do we have here? N factorial permutations, okay, which in this case is three factorial, which is six. So let's count inversions. None, none, none. So we have zero here. Three and two is an inversion. Three and one is an inversion. Two and one is an inversion. So we have three for a total of three here. And what is that in terms of our formula? That's three squared minus three over two. So nine minus three is six divided by two will be three. Right, so we have n squared minus n over two. So one and three is not an inversion, one and two is not an inversion, but three and two is an inversion, so there's one there. Two and three is okay. Two and one is wrong, right? That's an inversion, and three and one is wrong, so that's two, so together we have our three again, just like before. Two and one is an inversion, two and three is okay. One and three is okay, so there's one inversion. And three and one is an inversion, three and two is an inversion, and one and two is okay, so we have two, so we have three, so we're three, three, and three. So here we have nine inversions, and what's the average? Nine inversions divided by six permutations is 1.5 inversions on average, which we know to represent swaps. So how does our formula work? Well, what do we need to do to count? How would we get nine using our formula? Well, we have the n squared minus the n divided by two for three, but how many times do we get three? Well, remember, if we have six permutations, half of those can form pairs. So if we look at pairs of a sequence and its reverse, 
there will be n factorial divided by two pairs. There's a pair, there's a pair, there's a pair. And for each of those, we get, as a group, n squared minus n divided by two inversions. And we divide all this by our n factorial number of permutations. So this right here is equal to n factorial. I'm gonna take this two in the denominator here, multiply it through to get n squared minus n divided by four over n factorial. And write it this way allows me to cancel this out. So we see I have n squared minus n divided by four inversions. And this becomes one fourth of n squared minus one fourth of n and so we can see our average case has a big O value of n squared again, okay? Which is also what we have for worst case. But for best case, we saw this big O of n. So what are some comments we can make about uh, this? So we can say for bubble sort, slow even when compared to some other big O n squared algorithms. in general if we wanted the k largest elements could modify to stop after k runs Remember, we saw that after we pass through the day k times, the top k things will be in the last k positions. It sorts in place. Some algorithms will do something like this. Here's your original data. And then they'll say, okay, I need some additional memory and I'm gonna copy some things here. And maybe I copy some things here. Bubble sort just reuses all the same memory, just other than temporary places for like swapping. Swapping, of course, involves an additional element but that's trivial as compared to this. Then finally, it's what we call a stable algorithm. That is, uh, maintains relative order in, uh, or excuse me, of equal values. Let's say that you have the data. You have uh, Smith, Ralph, and you have Douglas, Charles, and then you have Smith, Alex. And you want to sort by last name and then subsort a first name. That is, when the last name is the same, then you'll sort by first name. Therefore, Alex Smith should come before Ralph Smith. Using bubble sort, what you could do is you could first sort by first name. If you did that, so your first sorting would be, this would give us Smith, Alex. Then you would get Douglas, Charles, then you would get Smith, Ralph, and then you would have a second sort of the data where you sort by last name. And because you already have Alex Smith before Ralph Smith, those would go together. So you would end up with your Douglas, Charles, and Smith, Alex. 
And finally, Smith. Ralph. Ralph. Okay. Because it's stable. If you have an unstable algorithm, and some of the, there are fast algorithms that have to be unstable, but there are different sorting algorithms and some would be unstable. In the case of an unstable sorting algorithm, if you did this first, there's no guarantee, it would depend on things, but there's no guarantee that when it's, you're now sorting by last name, you don't undo the relative order of these when there's a tie. So it could be useful in that case. But nonetheless, there's our algorithmic analysis of bubble sort, and I've shown three different versions. And so if you were going to use it, which should only be if n is small, because it is generally slow, you should use something like this. Now, one of the things you may have noticed is, why didn't I incorporate the fact that the last number will be fixed after the first run, second number fixed here? Why didn't we incorporate that here to do you know, something like we did before, where we have k was less than n minus 1 minus i? Of course, there is no i here, but we could have added that variable. You could, but I was just trying to analyze you know, these portions here, and therefore, um, that was just added slightly more complexity. But while it would affect actual runtime, it doesn't affect the order of growth, and therefore I didn't incorporate it.